Okay, good morning. Uh, let's go before the Lord and ask him to bless our time this morning. Father, we uh, thank you for another day to uh, gather as your body, Lord, and fellowship and praise you, Father. We pray that you would uh, use this time, Lord, to uh, prepare our hearts to hear from your word and for the conversations that we'll have, Lord. Just uh, pray that you would um, be amongst us, Lord, that your spirit would uh, use us this morning, and uh, we uh, give you this time in your name. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. All the day long. Oh Lord, we ask that that would be our story, Father, that our testimony would be of you and you alone, Lord, that uh, you would use your word this morning to transform us more into your image, Lord, more like Jesus. 
that we might be the light you call us to be. We give you this time in your name. Amen. Morning. All tangled up. Well, this morning we are going to finish up the last four verses of Psalm 101 fairly briefly and then hopefully get to Psalm 102. So, just a quick recap from last week. If you remember, David wrote Psalm 101 and he wrote this psalm in two sections. Uh, the first being um, his promises and commitments to God to be a king after a certain fashion. And as we uh, discussed last week, these attributes and these intents of David are applicable to individuals as well. I was talking to Pastor Ray sometime in the last couple of weeks about this, that There are many passages in the New Testament dealing with what pastors are supposed to do. Qualifications as well for elders. Qualifications for deacons. You read in some places, young men do this, old men do that. Young women do this and older women do that. But we we can make a mistake of compartmentalizing those into that particular whatever, title, role, demographic, and say, well, that's what they do, and this is what I do. But really, if you were to take out, if you look in the titification, or the qualifications for, for elders in Titus and in First Timothy, and took out the word deacon and elder, you'd be reading the description of the Christian life and how the Christian life is to be lived. What Paul was saying there is that these are very specific to the qualification for this office and don't lay hands on anyone in whose life that is, is not clearly exhibited, but, but he wasn't trying to make an exclusive claim to the attributes of an elder or a deacon, right? And so when you look in the Psalms and the Proverbs and other parts of the Old Testament, even though they're often uh, written to kings or to certain persons, um, they're applicable to all of us. And we saw that as we went through those first four Uh, verses last week. So the last four verses, verses 5 through 8, are God's response to David. And it's very similar, as I mentioned, to Matthew 6, 33. God, David says, I will seek you first above all things. And God says in the latter four verses, and all of this I will add unto you. Now, In verse 5, the Lord says, and and this is fairly severe. A lot of the language in the Old Testament seems fairly severe and and, and can almost seem, quote, you know, unchristian. But what the Old Testament does remind us of, though the covenant has changed, we are under a new covenant of grace, not under a covenant of law. We find that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not that God changes. God hasn't changed a whit. God is simply communicating to those he loves, which is the entire human race, and wants to love in a very special way. He wants everyone to come into that relationship of covenants, of worship, of obedience, trust, and faith. That's his will for everyone that they would do that. That while he does so, he is looking to have, uh, to, to, to apply the same faithfulness and relationship and covenant that he had when he was in the garden with Adam and Eve. God has not changed. He simply, and we call these uh, dispositions, some people call them dispositions. Calvary Chapel likes the term dispensationalism, and some don't. Some people call them covenants, or maybe five or seven, depending on your read. But all of them are simply more clearly revealing God's intent as time goes on. God doesn't change. And we find over and over again as we study the Psalms that God's intent and his heart and the way to favor, in a sense, with God has not changed since the beginning of time. So some of these verses sound a little caustic and a little difficult. But it does remind us that Old and New Testament both, God is a God of mercy 
and a God of judgment. Uh, Pastor Ray, the way he puts it, uh, and I like the graphic it gives you, uh, he says that it's not as if what some people think of as God, especially non-Christians, who have this vague idea of the Bible and Judaism and Christianity, is that the God of the Old Testament has a big beard and long flowing hair and a great big robe and he's throwing down thunderbolts from heaven and smashing people. And the God of the New Testament is this weak, frail little Jesus carrying a lamb on his shoulders. And they're like totally separate people. They just have enough, like that's one covenant and this is the other covenant. And of course we know that's simply not true. The God of the Old Testament declares himself to be compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. And by contrast, Jesus says to the Pharisees, if you do not believe that I am Jehovah, the Tetragrammaton, the Yahweh of Exodus chapter 3, you will die in your sin. You will go to hell and suffer forever. It's the same God, Old Testament, as New Testament. So, in verse 5 here, in Psalm 101, when, it, when he says, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. This is the ninth commandment, of course. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Well, God is a very, you know, we often say God has a special place in his heart for Israel, right? And he does. God has a special place in his heart for widows and for orphans and for the meek and the defenseless. Well, the fact is, God has a very special place in his heart for the proud. It's just not a good place. It's a bad place. Proverbs 6 has always kind of resonated with me in verse 16. It says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. That is not a contradiction. Well, there's a scripture contradicting contradicting itself just in one verse. There are these six things. Oh, wait, wait, I meant to say seven. It's not a wait, wait, I meant to say. It's a... Semitic, not just Jewish, by the way. It's a Semitic uh, idiom for saying, for emphasizing that there are actually seven. In other words, that that there are are enough of these that, in this case, it amounts to a perfection. Seven being the number of perfection. So it's just a way of emphasizing. And the first one listed. Well, I'll read through what they are: proud look, lying tongue, murder. Hearts that devise wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, false witness, as he mentions here in verse 5, one who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. But I want you to notice the first one is pride. When you think about it, pride is the very first sin committed that we have in the history of the universe. It wasn't in the garden, it was in heaven, Isaiah chapter 7, right, where uh, the, 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 the enemy of men's souls, the devourer, the roaring lion, Satan, I will, he has these five I wills, I will set myself up above the most high, which is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> There's only one most high, can't have two. Um, so pride is what led to his entrance into the garden and then to the fall and the eventual, well, the mess that we see that we have today. So what does he mean? Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him, I will destroy. Well, when God speaks of destruction, you have to remember his definition and biblical definitions of things are not always the same as ours. This is not, I will snuff you out and lights out, parties over. Sorry you didn't make it very well through this life. The fact is that even though this psalm and others extol the eternality of God, it's one of the attributes of God, that human beings are eternal. No one dies permanently. Jesus is very, makes that very clear, really, in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. What happens when you die? Well, you don't really die. But I thought you said die. I did mean die. But if you do it this way, you have eternal life. Well, what if you don't do it that way? Do you die and you're gone forever? No, you actually have life. It's, it sounds confusing, but it's not. It's just biblical terms. When God talks about eternal life, he's talking about a continued existence of blessing. And when he talks about the alternate to that, which is death, he's talking about eternal death, which is a continued existence of suffering. So we would say life in both cases. I think maybe a better term just for clarity would be existence. And God calls existence in heaven life, and existence in the lake of burning fire, he 
defines as death. Paul wrote this about pride. Don't think too highly of yourselves. Uh, I think it's also Proverbs chapter 3. Don't think too highly of yourselves. Why would he keep repeating that so often? Why would Jesus say, love other people the way you love yourself? <laughs> you know, Pastor Ray is right. When you go into your old yearbook, you're rum- rummaging through the closet or you're in the attic and you're dust. Oh, look at my yearbook from 47 years ago. And you go to the page of your class, who do you look for first? After 47 years, who are you looking for? You. Every time, you're always like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're wonderful, but hey, oh, there I am. I remember when I, we got our yearbook, at least at Minders, when I was in school, this was 40-some years ago. Whenever we got the yearbook, the first thing we would do is flip to the index. Is that what you do? You go back to the index and you find your name. And you say, page 17, page 42, page 109, 110, and you, go, and you look at all your pictures of yourself, right? That's why Jesus said, love your neighbor the way you love you. <laughs> And you didn't need to be taught that by your kindergarten teacher preaching self-esteem. You loved yourself out of the womb. I have a 16-month-old granddaughter, and I can personally testify to the fact that to her, she is the most important person in the world. (laughs) And the fact is, I'm 62, and it's true of me too. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because we think very highly of ourselves, generally. Well, verse 6 says, "'My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land.'" that they may dwell with me. He who walks with me in a perfect. And remember, Old and New Testament, that word is actually blameless. It doesn't mean perfect like God is perfect, never making a mistake, being sinless. It means blameless, and we all know I think what, what that means. He who walks in a blameless way, he shall serve me. It says in 2 Corinthians 16, 9, for the, or, or 2 Chronicles, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God is actively seeking loyal and faithful, committed men and women to serve in his kingdom. Romans chapter 8 where it says, all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. He's looking for those who are actively loving him. Not just the saved. God's looking for people to save, absolutely. But this means he's looking for those among the saved who want to actively serve him through obedience and worship. I I, I know it's not true that every saint, every heaven-bound person on the earth is actively serving the Lord because there are times since I've been saved when I have not been actively serving the Lord. So I know it's true of me and of you and hopefully for those of us who have a desire to serve God, that is less and less the, the, the characteristic of our life. More and more, as we become less and he becomes more, more and more we love and serve and God finds us. Oh, found one. Found one who, what does it say? Whose heart is loyal to him. It would appear, uh, we just have limited information really about some of the characters in the Bible, but you think of Samson, you think of Lot. Samson shows up in Hebrews chapter 11. It's like, Wow, you read his story in the book of Judges and there's not one single redeeming thing about this guy. I shouldn't even put it that way. It's not just it's not redeeming, it's all horrible. <laughs> Until the very end, he pushes down the, you know, the pillars and kills 3,000 Philistines. Um, Lot, Peter says, righteous Lot who was vexed by the sin around him. Yeah, you read their lives, you go, Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't, if it hadn't been for the New Testament, I would not have guessed these guys ended up in heaven. But apparently they did. But if your heart is to serve God, loving him, loving your neighbor, God will show up. And he will use you in his kingdom. I, a, a prayer that I frequently employ uh, when I'm in that mode of, Lord, forgive me for this and for that, and confessing my sins and repenting is, Lord, just wash me clean and make me a vessel fit for your purposes. I'm not saying, Lord, come in. I know he's in. I, the, the Holy Spirit enters permanently. 
But Lord, I want to be more than just saved. I want to be fit, a tool that just fits right in your hand, you know, that you can actually use today and have and be effective today. I, I kind of want to cross the finish line and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm not sure I'm going to hear it. I'm not being facetious or self-deprecating. I'm just not sure. And sometimes I feel more like I'm going to hear it, and sometimes I feel less like I might hear it. But I want to be one whose heart is loyal toward God and then when he, 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 he decides to use in his kingdom. And these admonitions, by the way, we're going through again. These apply equally. This could be God speaking about how he's going to handle the kingdom on David's behalf. It could be, it, as I said last week, this could be David continuing. This is how I'm going to act as a king. Either way is, is a bit of a moot point because when it comes to blessing people or selecting people for service, it's really no different whether they're serving a king or you got a CEO running a company or a pastor shepherding a church or whatever. You're looking for diligent, faithful people, right? That's who you want. Sometimes with the school, nobody here, so I can say this, I'm sure nobody out there in Facebook land, hi, Facebook people, I'm sure no one here w- w- would, be, would qualify. Um, occasionally, very, I'd spend 30 years, right, with the school, occasionally you get a volunteer who just isn't worth their, their, their weight. You know, they, they think because they're volunteering that there's no obligation involved and that they can just show up when they want or not. And man, I'll tell you, uh, one person not doing what they should be doing in a position where they should be negates the work of 10 faithful people. I'm telling you, they absorb more time and more energy and more emotional capital to correcting the situation. I got a guy right now, I have several people, wonderful volunteers in the school, but I got a guy right now who is uh, doing the hot lunch program for us. And it's like usually hot lunch. I, I, I go down and set up the tables or maybe, you know, somebody else might set up the tables. And there's, there's four or five people coming in and helping with cleanup. And this guy does everything by himself. Everything. I'm still in awe. I'm like, I don't know, I'm not sure I could do that. He sets up tables, he cleans the floor, he puts out the sponges for cleanup, and the, the buckets for the dirty dishes, he runs a dishwasher, he does a cooking, he does a cleanup, and you come in, and the place is, well, I don't want to say spotless because I'm a guy. I really have no concept, my wife tells me, of what clean actually is, but to my limited understanding, when I walk in, I'm like, shazam! It's like the little bing, the sparkle comes off the wall, you know? I tell this guy all the time, you are a treasure. Now, he's not like, unique, but it's like, wow, I'll take 10 more just like you. Yeah, I told the kids, I think I may have mentioned this last week, so forgive me, I told the kids in the school many times, when you're, when you're on a job and there's 100 people working for somebody, for your boss, and you're all on the same level, and the supervisor quits, how many people are you competing for with for that job? And they usually go, 100, because they have good math skills. But I tell them, it's not a matter of math. It's a matter of diligence and commitment and faithfulness and attitude and showing up early and going home late and doing more than you're paid for, cheerfully. I said, you are com- you're competing with probably three people. Because most people are going home and complaining and grousing about the job and the lousy working conditions and spreading discontent in the workplace. And See, that's why if you're this kind of person, you get, you get snatched out. And given more responsibility, promoted perhaps. So here's another critical attribute for relationship with God. Uh, service to the king, service to anybody, and that is honesty. Verse 7, he who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. That's a scary verse. I, I, can't, I can't find anything that massages works of deceit into something that really means something else. But we see perfect. We go, well, that really means blameless. And it does. And we do proper interpretation of Scripture based on context and uh, you know, textual things with other uses in other areas. He who lies shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. You know, If you've ever done any work with anybody, you know, and a bunch of you people here I know, you're involved in helping and counseling other people. There is no one harder to work with than a liar. And why is that? 
because you never know what you're working with. You can't give accurate counsel. You can't know if you're getting the circumstances as they really are. And everybody has faulty memories and different perspectives. You need to deal with that all the time. That's easy to sort out with talking to two or three people. You can pretty much get to the truth most of the time. But a liar? Very difficult. I'm a little better at it than most because I used to be a professional liar <laughs> when I was a teenager and a very young man. So I can smell it sometimes, but boy, some people are better than I am. <laughs> and it's hard. The writer of Psalm 119 makes a contrast, this is interesting to me here, between lying and actually loving the Word of God. Odd combination, right? But when you read through Proverbs sometime, you should read through Proverbs looking for this person does this, but this person does that. I love this, but God hates that. And you find these combinations of things that don't always go together. You're like, what do those two have to do with each other? Like greed, which is idolatry, Paul wrote. You go, are those connected? You think it through and you go, yep, they sure are. And this is one of those places. I hate... uh, Verse uh, 163 in Psalm 119. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Does that mean those two things are incompatible? Could be. There are at least a dozen proverbs dealing with lying uh, that you could look up on your own. Uh, God uh, deals with it fairly thoroughly. And finally, verse 8. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Again, what does destroyed mean? Well, in God's language, when he uses language like that, he's talking about eternal death, eternal destruction. So we have this wonderful psalm here, split in two, four verses. David, here's how I'm going to run my kingdom. Four verses, I believe, and and many Bible scholars have said the same, uh, that The last four verses are God saying, here's my response. I'm going to support you, David, and here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of the evil, wicked people for you in your kingdom. So let's go on to verse uh, Psalm 102. So we have this uh, inscription at the beginning of Psalm 102. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. And we find these these, uh, descriptions at the beginning of a bunch of, of the Psalms. They're not actually part of the Psalm itself. Depending on your Bible, it's interesting, you find like Psalm 102 and then the prayer of the afflicted, and some have the prayer of the afflicted and then Psalm 102, indicating that that little superscript there is not actually part of the original Psalm as it was written. They're, they're useful. Um, don't take, don't, don't, you know, if you ever see a book that compiles all the Psalm inscriptions and, and treats them as doctrine, just don't buy it uh, because you really. Uh, they are not necessarily inspired by God. They, they may be, it's possible. But they were added later by editors uh, for clarity and for finding stuff. Uh, they kind of remind me of, you know, the Gideon Bible has that page at the back where it says, if you're lonely, read this. If you're suffering, if you're anxious, if you're angry, whatever. That's kind of what they are. So you can find certain subject matter uh, in, in the scriptures easily. This psalm is about crushing debilitating anxiety brought on by stress, fear, being overwhelmed. Uh, We don't know who wrote it, but because it mentions the Lord rebuilding Jerusalem, uh, there is a possibility, and many believe, that this was written after the Babylonian exile when Nebuchadnezzar came, finally the last time in 586, and, you know, destroyed the city, uh, destroyed the temple, which would have been a huge spiritual, psychic blow to the Jewish people. Um, The author, therefore, may have been like Jeremiah, could have been Ezekiel, perhaps. They both lived uh, through that. Um, uh, Maybe Daniel. Impossible to say for sure. But, But the writing clearly indicates here that though it's a description of individual suffering, that it is tied to some national tragedy of some kind. So again, this is a psalm divided into two sections, and the break is extremely clear. Through verse 11, you have the complaint laid out, this, this really 
compelling, poignant description of suffering. And it centers on the idea of how frail people are and how temporary we are. Just like the grass, it grows up and it's burned and withered and, and, and goes away. We find that in the New Testament and the Old Testament alike, again here in this psalm. A lot of the phrases here, by the way, uh, we know it was written after Job, but we think all the Bible was written after Job, but this one for sure, uh, because uh, it borrows a lot of phrases directly from that book. This person was probably in a state where they were sitting reading Job, <laughs> and so uh, a lot of the, the phrases from that made it into their writing. Uh, he was perhaps the most famous sufferer of all time until Jesus, of course. Then in verse 12, there's this like clean break. There's a, a thematic switch that gets thrown here, and instead it goes to, well, the first line there is, but you, O Lord, shall endure forever. And it's almost as if the next, what, 17 verses or so are unnecessary. That's, that's the thematic switch we throw when we're in desperate times, right? But at some point, at some point we go, oh, right, but God. No despair, no hopelessness can outpace the love of God. What was it, Corey Ten Boom, that said, uh, there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Now look, I've never been in, the, in a Nazi concentration camp. Never had my family murdered. I've never seen my sister murdered right in front of me by a Nazi guard. So she could say that. I guess I can look at my light and momentary trials, though to me, they're very difficult. I can look at those and go, okay, there is no pit so deep that Jesus is not deeper still. So the first two verses here are really just an excellent prayer for the saint, regardless of the situation, great or small. These two verses just encapsulate the, the cry for God to come help. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. He then moves into this description of physical deterioration, uh, which has uh, some parallels in other psalms. Psalm 38, King David is expressing these physical manifestations, and in his case, brought on by sin. And yet we're pretty sure this is after the adultery with Bathsheba and then the, the, the deception that he, he, he uh, put in place to get that, her, her pregnancy uh, from being attached to him. He tried to get it attached to Uriah and then murdering Uriah uh, as a result of the failure of that, where David says, there's no soundness in my flesh, no health in my bones, my wounds are foul and festering, my loins are full of inflammation. There's no soundness in my flesh. I'm feeble, severely broken. I groan, turmoil of heart. My heart pants. My strength fails me. The light of my eyes has gone out. That's over a bunch of different verses. But David tells us it's all happening because of guilt over his sin. So here the psalmist says in verse 3, My days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I think it's just, I'm not going to make anything out of it, just an interesting turn of phrase. Usually we would say my skin clings to my bones. I don't know what it means, but my bones cling to my skin. Obviously this person is emaciated and wasting away. You know, some people, when they have a lot of stress, they stress eat. I, I, I tend to be that. If I get under like, stress or something, I tend to eat. Of course, I eat all the time. It's hard to tell the difference. But I tend to eat more when I get stressed out. And some people, like, hey, I lost 47 pounds in the last month. I'm so upset. I'm like, I'd, I'd weigh 147 pounds more if I was upset after a month. Um, which is why it's a good thing not to be upset for a month, right? Probably a good thing to go right to the Lord <laughs> and let the waters of life just flow through you. And by the way, we should thank God that the Psalms, it appears to me, that the Psalms, almost all of them, maybe there are one or two exceptions, never end on a negative note. 
They don't start out with, oh, Lord, it's horrible. What's wrong? My enemies are afflicting me, and they're whispering and telling lies, and my bones are wasting away. And the, uh, the army's encamped around me, Lord. Even those I love have lifted up their foot again. They don't end that way. They end with, but God. Now, that's not true in every case. There are a couple of Psalms that don't do that, but that's not the general formula. So my belief is the Psalms aren't written in the moment. The Psalms are written after it's all been resolved. Perhaps. It could be that a person like the one writing this, when he switches to verse 12, is in the middle of it, and it hasn't been resolved, and he suddenly has that but God moment. That's my hope. Because that's where God wants to get us to. What do we say around here? That Miriam shook the tambourine after they got across the Red Sea. How much better would it have been to shake the tambourine when there was no way out? Mountains on both sides, the Red Sea behind them, and Pharaoh's army advancing down the valley. And nowhere to go. And by the way, Jews don't swim. (laughs) I'm kidding. But in the Old Testament, the sea is always a, a picture of something negative. When it's used in any way except, oh, when he was on the sea in a boat. No, when they talk about the sea, when it says in, is it Revelation 13, and then uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dragon stood by the sea, it's in front of the multitudes of the world. They were not a seafaring nation. They had to hire Hiram to get their gold from Ophir to their shores and to get the cedar logs down from Hiram's, from Lebanon. They did not have a navy. They considered the sea a tumultuous, dangerous place to be. So I joke and say the Jews don't swim. Well, they didn't back then. They weren't into it much. Right? So, this is an expression of total hopelessness. And I'm hoping this guy who wrote this in verse 12, in the middle of it all, went, wait a minute. But there's always the Lord. Doesn't mean we all of a sudden don't have any fear or no anxiety whatsoever. I get that. There's a human condition. and the, One of my favorite verses in the Bible. God knows our frame and we're just dirt. You don't need to feel guilty because you're crying out to God with a faithful heart and you still feel anxiety. You might have a condition that causes anxiety. Some people do. And feel very guilty about that. The question is, not what are your emotions at the moment, what is your, what is your heart, your, your bowels, your mind, your attitude toward God? Am I looking to God for the answer? If that's the case, then my condition is his, his problem at that point. Some people are like, I just can't rid of the guilt. And people, well, you, should, you don't need to forgive yourself. God has to forgive you. What are you talking about forgiving yourself? And it's like this, going to this diatribe over doctrine when a person's suffering emotionally. But I've been to the Lord, I've confessed, I've repented. The answer to that is wonderful. Then just wait on God. He'll take care of, don't feel guilty about the fact that you aren't like jumping for joy and slapping your hands together in the middle of your crisis. God gives us faith, it says, according to his measure, right? So we're gonna have to stop there. I'm a little bit late. So we will pick up, God willing, uh, next week. Uh, we'll continue talking about these verses, uh, three, four, and five. So, Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for King David and for the sons of Hezekiah and for Asaph and Moses, all those who wrote these psalms, Lord, and for preserving it for us down through all the generations, Lord, to bless us and admonish us, Lord, to encourage us and convict us today, to teach us, Lord, how to live our lives, how to be in proper relationship with you and with each other. Lord, we want to be tools that are fit vessels that are fit for your habitation and for your use. Give us hearts, Lord, that cry out for you, blamelessly, imperfectly, but blamelessly walking through this life with you, that you might be ministered to by us, Lord, just like Aaron and the priest did. They ministered to the Lord as you minister to us, Lord. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.